Hello everyone, today we talk about Achaemenid Chariot Warfare and more specific the uh, Satan Chariot uh, that uh, essentially appears from the end of the 5th century. Today's video is dedicated if you want to, uh, you know, uh, ideally around 400 BC Chariot, something like, something like that. Um, that came to be a, a common part of the army. And we have explained here and there already. We started a series now specifically dedicated to Bronze Age warfare, so we will get a lot into chariotry and their employment and things like these. But we have fundamentally observed how chariots had gradually, uh, with the rise of infantry during the Iron Age, uh, declined in number but increased in size somewhat. And um, the side in itself that is is a dangerous tool even for you know for, for those that you know even for friends right because already managing chariots in combat is not easy if you, if you don't put a, say, um, a scythe and you fundamentally see how in fact difficult it was to maintain control even properly on the crew and eventually with the same chariot that would be launched sometimes literally as we will see uh, with crews baning out not optimally Right, that was not a, a good thing to do, but it, it was becoming increasingly risky because the impact was becoming increasingly riskier. Right, so we will we still have to make all like you know the various battles. Also, I never really talked about uh, Alexander's campaign, it's and, and so on. So, uh, as you know, it's not that we have this dramatic information about uh, such times and places in. In, in great de in great detail, right, and nuisance, and we, we don't, we, we can't guess, essentially, just from certain authors, from certain evidence, and trying to, 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 to nucleate, like, kind of a picture that m makes more or less, more or less sense. And, in fact, when we talk about around this age, by the end of the 5th century, the, the main question is what Xenophon says, right? Uh, the author ascribes uh, their introduction to Cyrus the Great. You know, Xenophon had a, an extensive knowledge of Persian warfare at that time, as a mercenary had served within, you know, the, the civil strife uh, within the uh, within the empire. It's all a time in which Hellenic civilization was permeating the same uh, the same Achaemenid Empire as it had gone, you know. Uh, uh, the, the other way, right, uh, since the beginning of this enormous universal empire that essentially Greece had emerged at the outskirts of and obviously, you know, even factually partly within it, right? It's mostly a Western perspective to consider the fact that, you know, there was a West that was outside of this of this bubble. It's not really true, right? And you can argue that the West was born exactly from the within the, the Achaemenid Empire, also because, in fact, if you look at the uh, Hellenic thought, philosophy, kind of, you know, the abstraction, the rationality, we'll talk about it soon for other reasons, actually, but they emerged mostly on, uh, in Asia Minor, right? Just later, the thing was became more properly Greek, um, geographically speaking, but even though it was part of the, of the broader culture across the gen, of course. Um, but it, it's always important to understand the role of, um, of individuals within a, a context, right? Uh, in this case, Xenophon banally ascribes uh, basically every kind of person institution to Cyrus the Great. So when we talk about cited chariots, this, this might have been practically not non factual. Chariot warfare, first of all, was, was out there, and Xenophon being more specific about the cited one um, is uh, essentially telling us that this went as far back like one century, right? So, um, and it, it's strange though that up to Xenophon himself, we had fundamentally never heard of sighted chariots. Um, and that is um, the, the perplexity that we have. That is, it may have been that, you know, such uh, weapon, let's call it in this way, w was being developed around that time as well. Uh, I have legitimate doubts also about uh, in the other direction, right? It's possible that such things existed, maybe not such on a you know greater scale as later on, because of the function that chariot was was assuming, and even the rise of Hellenic infantries, and you know what Xenophon himself you know kind of embodied you know in, as a 
as a broader mercenary model that was essentially to uh, to take over in a way even within the same Achaemenid army that lacked such consistent uh, hardness in infantry, right? And that, and especially also professionalism at some level, not really more than much. We actually ac the Achaemenid military is is dramatically overlooked and misunderstood. Um, definitely, uh, you know, by the time of of the Persian Wars, it was a, a much more advanced um, system than than the Hellenic one. Right, and people like to see even in their kind of a determinism about the fact that the West had to win and all that stuff, and that there was some kind of technical superiority. It's absolutely false, right? The the level of collective training that the Achaemenid armies had was just barely dreamt by the, the Hellenic city states, uh, and especially in that kind of multi-arm employment. Right? You can't even say, "I'll oh, look at the Spartan." No, right? Here we're talking about a. a, a an enormous civilization and an incredible capacity that you know if the Persian Wars even just by themselves that haven't made you realize <laughs> there is probably sometimes there is a bias in that in the other in that sense and and I like every everyone in history like I don't as a military historian I don't give a damn about what you know what the broader attachment it could possibly have I like the Greeks as I like the Persians and I just try to to be objective about uh, the substance, but again, w when when I make this video, I always realize that after almost you know after three years that I make uh, a video every day about the, such things, I, we still haven't covered even the, the the start of all right and the the, the very beginning of, of what the wall of the wall question will have to 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 do time allowing really you know tens or even hundreds of videos before <laughs> considering ourselves satisfied about the, the world picture. In any case, um, the um, there are other things that uh, Xenophon says that is, sound quite fictional. For example, the, the towers drawn by eight yoke of oxen and carrying 20 men, right? Uh, in the Cura uh, Pai, the uh, 6, uh, 1, 52 to 54, that's the source. Um, and um, However, we know Pers about Persian territory, right, as frequently shown, for example, in the Persepolis sculptures. Um, however, in this case, its its only military function may have been as command vehicles, right? Uh, this is important because you know that the Achaemenids were essentially a, uh, part of, you know, the, the Median people. They, they were mostly mastering advanced cavalry warfare, I mean, areas where, you know, the chariot had gradually declined, uh, paradoxically having been born out of those places, and then eventually from, you know, an Indo-European steppe people becoming factually uh, an ecumenic imperial dynasty centered in, you know, essentially between Mesopotamia and, and Persia, uh, they adopted most of what what was the, the st what were the standards of such a sedentary civilization, right? Uh, in including territory in in the form that had gradually been evolving in Assyrian times and so on. So the changes continued over time. Maybe we will see it on another occurrence. Um, but um, we we have th this impression from certain sources that. Uh, Chariot warfare at the beginning might have been less developed than we think among the, the Achaemenid within the Achaemenid military culture. Herodotus tells the Xerxes um, in a chariot on, on the march, right? But he actually doesn't mention it among the in, com in, in combat uh, in the Achaemenid army, except for the chariots of foreign contingents that the, the Persians dominated around the world um, and that Yes, we know they use chariot in in in, in common. Um, there are some also deeper mm, symbolical, religious, spiritual connections with chariot, of course, that hadn't died out in the Achaemenid world, as in most of the, the peoples in the area would remain very strong up to even you know the Middle Ages. You would be surprised by by that kind of the the conception of the, the, the Aryan glory of the skies and so if you look at the Khwarezmians by the 13th century what they 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 how they represented properly the the divine power of, of heaven like uh, essentially carrying a drum on a chariot and the drum is yet another thing about you know what the the, the shamanic trance of 
you know, ritual passages of warriorhood stemming from millennia of years old from the steps in the same area. So much that in Zoroastrianism you have the sacred chariot of Agra Mazda, drawn by eight white horses with a charioteer behind them holding the reins and uh, the, the, the literal statement is for no mortal man may mount into that chariot's seat. Right, and that's the the deal. Right, that if if uh, it was forbidden in a sense, almost if not to the the king of kings. Well, no, naturally, you know, chariots existed, were employed in combat also by others, but there was a kind of an elite character connected to that at that point, as it had always been in a way or another in any society that had used chariots. But um, that was in this moment, in fact, kind of detached a bit from the from the medium, uh, the gold standard, let's say, of, of warfare that was not heading towards the deferred development of chariot, of chariotry. So, um, we have to understand just the refinement of chariotry that happens here for also the foreigners to, to understand, meaning that, that the, the increase in size of chariots for the sake of smashing into enemy lines is something that you find, I don't know, even in the Hellenistic armies later on, not as the, the bulk of their army, of course, as it had been, you know, uh, some centuries before. But um, fundamentally, the, um, uh, you know, this, this weird, kind of almost eccentric thing, right, that had been dying, right, but that was functional at that point just because these were very powerful um, states fielding, you know, capable of fielding properly from an infrastructural point of view, enormous resources, and sometimes investing them with this kind of twisted, a scientistic and technologistic bias um, that a bit coming from from Hellenic mindset, but pro probably from from the the I mean not in the same way, but in this regard for showing this magnificence, the idea that it could also field things like elephants, like chariots, right? So with a symbolism that was the idea of, of ecumenic and encompassing all the all the powers that could be found in the world, right? So enormous chariots were few in c consistently but they were enormous and that for that reason could smash into the much better organized and drilled and you know uh, resistant infantries of that time and um, this thing of the sacred uh, chariot is a big deal because because uh, it was brought on campaign Xerxes entrusted the sacred chariot to the Paeonians rather than taking it to Greece Right, uh, because in, in some ways that uh, it was uh, I don't know whether this episode is you know is factually true or not, but, but it speaks of you know something risky you know, considering the situation that would arrive to deny that bringing this major symbol of power in a place that you would have uh, ideally to consider already subjugated, right, and that you know the symbol the the chariot itself embodied in terms of this the the supreme celestial. Uh, for Im imagine the, the Greeks having, uh, you know, taken it, but actually Xerxes failed to recover it. Right? This is told us by Herodotus, eight, uh, one hundred six uh, sixteen. Also, Cyrus the Younger rode a chariot on the march to the battle of Cunaxa, albeit he fought on horseback. Hmm? Always remember the older ideal. What it was the idea is that the the the, the hero, right? Of, since Bronze Age comes on the battlefield on on a chariot, right? Literally because he doesn't, he's so powerful. It's as if the the forces of destiny is ahead uh, of you know of destiny in the world and his power of man had broken there without doing anything, just by wanting it, right? Also because they were amazingly um, heavy in in equipment, so the idea is guys should have dismounted and you know fought just in this incredibly short and intense uh, psychophysical exertion so still in 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 academic times the idea was yes you arrive in the battlefield on horseback but then you fight in uh, on on chariot but you fight in another way in this uh, was, uh, way uh, actually on horseback and naturally the quest the equestrian culture the academics was combined deeply but properly one of the step and now what properly horsemanship had become warfare and uh, Darius the third also entered the field of battle on his chariot at both 
uh, Issus and Gaugamel. Um, the side-bearing chariot is first mentioned at the Battle of Kunaxa, right? Uh, it, it wasn't new al altogether uh, as a thing, right? Also because you find such weapon from both sides, right? Uh, Albite Cyrus had only a few, while Artaxerxes' uh, uh, chariot were driven against Cyrus Greeks with very little success, which speaks for you know what we were saying before about the hardening of infantry and the capacity of standing their ground against chariots. Cons consider at this point. Uh, it's not a matter of pike or like you may think mechanically, mechanistically or you know, the Macedonians later on had the, 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 the Saris and all these things. No, these were hoplites would be able to withstand uh, a charge like of, of everything, like of, of horses as, uh, you know, as yeah, horsemen as, as of charioteers. Um, and the um, in, in this failure, the chariot crew abandoned the, their vehicles, and the Alains opened their ranks to allow the um, unguided vehicles to pass through, right? Only one man being ridden down. So this this is a tactic that, um, as you, as you understand, is not really functional from both sides. Really, um, chariots could be stopped, and uh, there is a there are significant examples of these uh, battles. We we, I made back in the day a video on the Battle of Dasculium, uh, Dasculium that um, was a good example. Essentially, these were that were some Hellenic foragers, but actual hoplites caught in the open. Uh, so there was a small engagement, right? There weren't many, but you know the the Persians also were a few, and they attacked with chariots. And since the Greeks hadn't been able to, you know, arm themselves and re and uh, align themselves properly, etc. Remaining compact and also being caught by surprise were, were taken down by, by chariots on that occasion. So it's not really about a you know, you have that jolly card of the of the chariots and you they're always going to smash through at all. Right? This is not really the case. But also opening up some some gaps within the formation just to, to make the 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 chariots pass through is by itself uh, a bit positivistic in in, in intention so, right you you can't do that rather instances where you find other of such tactics i don't know think about the elephants at zama right all these but it, the chariot is something slightly different and it is it should be properly trained to smash into the i mean the whole, even the horses the horses normally are not going to you know, to, to, to do such a thing, but, you know, some of them do, and, and I presume that they were selected exactly in this kind of aggressive fashion for which uh, it was important literally to smash into the... Now, uh, now, I don't want to digress on this thing and how that they could have opened ranks, and so because because it's, it's all very... Uh, like, we don't know enough about that, but uh, while from one side it's possible, from the other side it's, it, it sounds a bit mechanistic in, in nature, right? Uh, uh, normally formations do not open gaps among the ranks uh, as such, right? That, that's all what their consistency is about as a formation. There are gaps between... I made even a video about that last spring explaining that one thing is, you know, one freaking section of the line collapsing. Another thing is the gaps between the units. Right, and people often don't understand the difference between such things, right, or and not. And very often, and when we study battles, it's not about this small unit tactics that make the difference, but the bi like literally the big chunks of the army, like the, the 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 wings or the center collapsing and therefore allowing somebody breaking through. But you know, passing through just like that is um, it may happen. I give you that with something like elephants or chariots, but it, it it's not something you can always count on that will go well and. Also, it all depends on how compact and drilled and determined and, and, and the, the enemy formation is. Because, yes, there is a substantial space between a chariot and another, but it's not really enough for, you know, containing a wall unit and gaps be between it w with, a cons with a consistent um, physical, you know, connection. Also, considering what the, the, the phalanxes were 
like, albeit at this point they were kind of fluidifying in nature as also more flexible and professional systems, uh, especially this this mercenaries that were used and so on, um, in in relatively contained numbers. Uh, the idea is, is still that the phalanx is a is a, is a continuous line, right, of some consistency that you can't really fracture uh, per se. Mm, just for saying, okay, let's make chariots pass. Those chariots are going to hit you straight in, in the face, right? If they if they are able, to, and that you can't really change that much. Um, uh, the formation for for that, otherwise you want to fight in, in a dramatically open order that has never been seen in the history of mankind. Just to make you know single guys, you know, dodging the, the chariots and having an enormous space around. It's not possible. Um, so. But historiographically speaking, you do find such ideas, and uh, at that point, it's more coherent to think that for some reason these chariots were not used properly, or they were maybe channeled on purpose in certain corridors because they they, they had no the deformation had not too much consistency on its own. They would just pass through and hoping to to get away in some other fashion. But we weren't there to to see. Um, in fact. As we were saying before, at the Battle of Dasculion in 395 BC, uh, Farna Bazas used uh, actually only two to charge into a mass of hastily formed Hellenic uh, foragers, breaking their formation. And at that point, um, allowing the cavalry to follow up to, for, for the attack. This is in Xenophon Hellenica for, uh, for uh, one from 17 to 19. Um, and yes, I say foragers, but these were actually all plights, right? Right. Um, and Darius the uh, third. That was the strategic function, right? When they were equipped, right? They, they were they were standing there as heavy infantry, so it's important even just two chariots could could do that. Darius the third fielded two hundred sighted chariots at Gaugamela. That was a lot. Mm -hmm. So normally it would be uh, much less in general, as we were saying before, also because they cost it a lot. Um, and it, in here, also with limited success, right? Somewhere taken out by enemy light infantry could jump around and, you know, taking them down. Albeit a later source like Curtius claims that some successfully charged uh, home, right? So causing casualties and even breaking the Macedonian ranks. And again, this is perfectly possible, telling the truth. I mean, it's obvious that the... Uh, let, let's be honest about this. Again, there, it's not always going as you wish. If you have 200 chariots, uh, some are going to be, you know, taken down for some reason uh, before, maybe for some some hit from skirmishers, or maybe when some they are stopped, then they're assaulted, the crews they're assaulted, others will simply, you know, be stopped by some Bike meant that will manage to kill the horses and to 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 stop the, the the impact like that, but there is nothing mechanical that prevents the resistance of that infantry to to break in the face of a chariot charge in the first place. That is to say, uh, there is not an homogene a perfect homogeneity within army ranks. Uh, uh, you know, just because those guys are I don't know the pike men, they have to stop. No. Uh, that the same thing of I don't know medieval warfare I've seen so many times. Essentially, what weapon you have has virtually no significance in the 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 how a, a formation manages to to exist, right? Of course, a pike is better to stop cavalry, and ac it's actually the only weapon that makes that. But that has nothing to do with, and as we have seen before, also these pikes, how long were they, right? They were not terribly long. Not even the Sarissa were that particularly long, actually. We're around four or five meters, telling the truth, not the eight that we are we're used to, to imagine. Um, uh, for some excruciating problems of interpretation of texts and ancient measures that now we cannot digress on, but I promise I will make a video on. Um, it's about the moral strength of the unit. That is to say, how how much you're trained and determined and fit to stand your ground while a, a chariot and multiple chariots are charging at you. That's the only thing that makes the difference, right? 
uh, pikes were used all the time to stop cavalry, but there were times in history where cavalry had a dramatic su moral superiority, uh, such as during the High Middle Ages, for which basically hardly anybody could withstand in open field a cavalry charge. Of course they had pikes. It's a prehistoric weapon, one of the most ancient ones. This has nothing to do with how the art of war developed. Right? It's not about the weapons that you have that makes the difference in battle. Concretely. It's much else altogether. Those are important indeed, but not so important in the broader picture for when you finally understand how complex it is and when you, you know, drive away from a war game -istic, uh kind of, you know, mona monadic or individualistic idea of, of what war you think it is and when you start realizing that everything is about moral forces and collective training. Um, so, of course, at Galgamela some, some Achaemenid chariot smashed through, you know, a Macedonian pikeman, but of course it did, and I want to know how many you know legs have been chopped off by the sides in that situation. But it's obvious, right? You can't break uh, the solidity of a formation by doing that. It's just that, as far as we know, uh, it wasn't dramatically successful on the collective level. And again, because probably you know this sides, uh, this, this charioteers maybe were not that good, or you know the, the Macedonian phalanges were actually pretty pretty good. Uh, in any case, that's how we reconstruct also with that degree of uncertainty everything everything ancient and something so messed up like a battle. Um, so, mm, Xenophon describes the sighted chariots at Kunaxa as well. In, in, he says, with quote, thin sides extending at an angle from the axles and also under the driver's seat, turned towards the ground so as to cut through everything in their way. So extending properly the height of how much they 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 grinded they, they cut they could cut up and down. Uh, and also he gives uh, an even more detailed description of Cyrus the Great's double uh, dub you know doubtless fictional chariots which is clearly based upon the real chariots of Cyrus the Younger. So these seem to have been uh, driven by, uh, dr drawn by f four horses, each to two poles, quote, with wheels of great strength so as not to be easily broken and with a uh, axle trees that were long. The box for the drivers he made like a turret, the drivers he carved all but their eyes with armor. The, the axle trees on each side of the wheels, he added steel sides of about two cubits. So it's something like 90 centimeters, uh, three feet long. And below, under the axle tree, he fixed other point, uh, pointing to the ground. Mm -hmm. This is particularly interesting. Uh, aside from the structure, but of of the um, of the chariot and the, the sides and dimension and all, but also for the attention for the drivers, right? Uh, all covered in armor, so essentially cataphracts, right? And uh, just so much uh, with, with some eyeslits that could, in order to see, of course, well, as maneuverability, you know, has a lot to do with visibility um, as well or direction ability, whatever you want to call it, anyhow. And and that speaks for, you know, an important problem of, of chariots, of course, they, they were somewhat big targets, so you can imagine, even on the distance, that uh, you see cavalry is vulnerable to missile fire, and, um, and these horses were surely armored at some, by some degree, especially in the, um, you know, in the elite units and so on, uh, frontally. Because also that was the deal of chariots. Now it wasn't about complex, much complex maneuvering. It was properly, you know, going straight against the enemy, and that's what was most of warfare was actually about. But um, in the case of chariots, especially properly to to maximize their effect and their also because they exhaust. So imagine here with our four horses allegedly, but you know in general that these uh, chariots were enormous, and still the the armor as we've seen required was well, extra weight. So. Uh, these things tired themselves easily, and uh, the ground may be a nightmare, <laughs> in this, especially in a, in a battle. Even when it's good for 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 cavalry, it's flat enough. But uh, 
you know, cavalry cavalry is dramatically more agile, right? And chariots are always this thing that is, is even dangerous, especially with size, you know, because if the if the horses start running amok, it, it you know, they can't turn against you. It's, it's a mess, right? And it did happen. Did happen. Think about Manesia. Think about that. There are instances of that. And targeting the horses with missile was seemingly the deal, right? Even with horse skirmishers and so on. So that's quite quite interesting. Um, and um, so Xenophon also mentions a door in the chariot body by which the driver entered, which suggests uh, again that there was some vulnerability. Uh, if not properly from missiles, but properly from crews being assaulted, right, when the chariots stopped and they could be reached by, I don't know, even lighter troops. And if if the crew was so, uh, you know, so heavily armored, right, it was difficult, and they had to, to drive, so it was difficult to even react to such attacks. And and drivers, as far, you see, back in the day, the, you know, chariot crews were were pretty, uh, they could arrive up to three and so on. At this point, yeah, there was somebody else uh, sometimes, but the, the, the concept is that the, the functionality of the chariot now is ever more uh, tied to the to that collective straight smashing into the enemy lines and not much of any other sophistication. So that's why we will eventually know that some of these some of these crewmen bailed out before impact and that this actually made somewhat the 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 the, def the effectiveness of the charge sinking because the horses were taken other directions and so on but it was almost kind of a suicide thing and but the objective was to break up break uh yeah break the the the, the enemy line and causing horrendous gaps within it so they could be exploited by other units such as cavalry any infantry though um, at the same time so that that's quite important because it's it, that's it's almost like a missile weapon rather than a cavalry one right because you don't count on recovering the chariot at the end of battle for some reason it's just like unless you win of course but meaning it, that's not the point you see, also cavalry is planted at some point, but at least it, it, it makes complex maneuvers, can carry out multiple charges. Chariots don't. Um, so it's literally about smashing and softening up the, the enemy line as much as possible, and, and then following up with other units that are, again, the, the most important. Uh, the bulk of these armies were not, were, were, was not made up by chariots, per se. Um, we know that the drivers were armored with a set of cuirass, helmet, arm defenses, while the horses did have, in fact, bronze head and breast armor, and parapleuridia to protect the flanks. It is essentially a um, an armored uh, saddle, kind of like, and it was attached, I presume, to the yeah, probably to the horses, but it's in correspondence of. Yeah, properly of the flanks and the sides, that, and this tells, of course, that uh, projectiles could arrive at that point from multiple directions as well. Uh, which is meaningful because if, especially the sight in this regard was, uh, you see, if, mm, uh, you know, the sight has to be effective if you pass through the enemy lines because you know you have to uh, go in depth in order to to to, to cut somebody's length with that pass true right so at that point of course the horse risk because it was exposing the, the the side so much as the crew as we've seen hence the reason right this is not any more like like in, in the past centuries like the 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 like just a shooting platform that at the end of the battle it's eventually sent to to overwhelm the the enemy with with shock attack uh, with a charge uh, this is just literally hoping to pass through the enemy line at a fir with a, at a single blow right and uh, and this speaks for the whole tactic of how it had it had developed concretely. Um, Diodorus, uh, seventeen fifty three, describes the chariots at Gaugamela, 
with sides three spans long so we're talking about something like six, 68 centimeters something less than what we've read before something like 27 inches and we're attached to the ends of the yoke cutting edge forward and two more at the axle housings longer and broader and curved at the ends uh, probably I think these chariots were had some kind of pointy you know protrusion in fact uh, at the front because that could have been easy some some of the later linistic ones also had spikes on the on the yokes um, so that properly the, the idea was also yeah piercing smashing cutting everything that they found in front of them and in this sense always remember that the first blow is psychological right the chariot is not much about what makes in the impact after all but as we've seen in this uh, say um, the or at least that is subordinated to this uh, s psychological resistance of the enemy right so the more they were and they the more they were loaded in this regard and the, the better that this, this thing would blow your mind you would maybe break the line in before impact or running away and at that point the chariot could have passed through and cutting so much <laughs> so much limbs in, in, in the process so that's what they wanted to happen Diodorus doesn't mention the sites under the body which may have been abandoned right but uh, they, 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 they make sense right and it, they may perhaps have some problems regarding the ground um, but again, it, it depended probably on the chariots and their typology. I don't know. Maybe they had fallen in use in the times of of Diodorus himself. Uh, but let's say that um, yeah, I mean that there could be dif different options. Um, and at the end of the Curopi, the uh, Xenophon reflects in general on the decline of Achaemenid warfare, right? Which is a true thing. Um, we will make a video about at some point. Generally speaking, it's this uh, gradual reliance, even more on foreign troops. Um, not that properly the Achaemenid military was was bad. It's, it's just that that first drive, that first political cohesion, that first willingness to you know just participate collectively as a as a people, right? Properly, even the the Persian element there was was less uh, evident right so uh, that's what eventually made the empire crash in perspective right not maybe not as a decisive factor right Alexander's campaigns are sound very few in history where to a great commander wasn't opposed actually any other command no other commander right so it, history may have gone differently but if you think about that the command empire lasted kind of 200 years it was something um you know transient if you want in the history of mankind doesn't matter how high impacting it was from a cultural point of view that is often overlooked but um it was such great of thing that it was ever more difficult to keep to together right and in this uh, broader reflection xenophon addresses properly the decay of this uh, of of uh, Scythian chariots, chariot warfare. He stated that the Persians used unskilled and underpaid driver drivers at that point, and quote, they do indeed make an attack, but before they can break into the enemy ranks, some involuntarily fall out. Involuntarily, others jump down and run away. So that the driverless chariots frequently do more injury to their friends rather than to their enemies so this is a typically a so Hellenic mindset in the way he says and because he, he makes a point that that is punching right and things that ho however you know are a bit too mechanical in nature but because it, it's interesting after all it says they they can't break into enemy ranks some involuntarily fall out just imagine <laughs> like you know yeah as we were saying the terrain may not be perfect but you know somebody involuntarily falling out of the chariot like how the hell can that happen right even you know even if you, you know there's a bumpy road or something you know if you you don't get literally catapulted out of the of the vehicle unless you know xenophon is talking 
properly about at the moment of impact, but at that point, you know, mission accomplished. So it doesn't. It, 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 it does really seem that this would have happened in some other way. It's another occurred. Anyhow, yes, let's not underestimate the difficulties of the ground in a sense. Then it says other jumped down and ran away. This is more realistic, even though we have seen that apparently some of these chariots at least had kind of doors that could open them and run away. Jump down. So what while running, right? While while charging. So that the driverless chariots frequently do more injury to their friends than to their enemies, which is, you know, even if that you know, that's in fact the mentality I was talking about, even if that was true, it's not that chariots have a a magnet that reattracts them necessarily against you know the your own lines, right? If if the horses are scared, maybe maybe they do want to come back, but uh, you know you know these are horses trained expressly and they are heading towards the enemy, and uh, if they fear to crush into an, uh, into a line, whichever it is, why should they make necessarily more harm to the enemy than to the friends, right? Of course, if this means that the the chariots altogether can mess themselves up in the process, so that there is an order in the formation for which these guys slip away and and the horses start taking different directions without driver, yeah, it's kind of possible, right? That they, 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 they can't crash into other chariots and make a mess and you know weakening the broader uh, thing. But in general, it, it's this broader dismissal saying you know. A commanded chariots suck at this point, right? So Xenophon is making uh, making a point about that, and he has to provide some kind of evidence without, however, properly explaining in detail what this this happens like. Or, but still, it, it's a very important information, all in all. Um, and when when the saying Xenophon, because there is this description of Cyrus the Great's chariots. Right, and even if that is probable fiction, as we were saying before, it it actually shows the Xenophon that had faced real s sided chariots in battle, thought that they could be very effective when properly handled. And you know, if chariots are used in in combat, it's not that you know the the, the Achaemenids were going on for you know hundreds of years, you know, or from that moment onwards. Uh, from Xenophon's time to to Alexander, uh, you know, sucking, right? Uh, these things had a standard. If you bring this means of war, they're after they're all pretty universal at that point. In into battle, it's because you you kind of know how to use them. So the accidents of war are infinite, but this doesn't mean that by default that chariot is kind of a bad idea in the first place, or that uh, on average this n people do not know how to use, right? It's too mechanistic it's too it's too positivistic as a judgment right and of course such chariots were effective still and it would remain for for a long time and xenophon describes this imaginary battle for cyrus the great where chariots um managed to impact the enemy and um so much that the confusion uh, within the enemy ranks at that point caused by them was was exploited by the infantry that was clo following close behind the chariots. Um, so this is a particularly important statement because of course as we've seen Xenophon knew how chariots were used and he tells us that at least in his perspective at that point in history that was the practice right having chariots being closely supported by another arm so that um, the impact they, they caused in enemy lines could be exploited by, by other troops that at that point could have been tactically fit. So this tells a lot together with the fact that these drivers were killed in the process um, how um, properly destructive this tactic was also properly also from the same, for the same charioteers Right, this was they were a mean to an end, and that's why it was kind of uh, vital in a sense. You know, if you really wanted to make it to to be the heavier and the, even the, the the least maneuverable in a sense, just to smash through and hoping that th this this could be successful. 
otherwise you are being taken out and there is not it's not very difficult to understand how in that sense you know the chariot stops for some reason surrounded by the enemies the guy is taken down that's it right um, so also how close could chariots be supported especially by infantry because chariots run and even if infantry run after the chariots at that point which is something that you know usually formations do not do for maintaining their cohesion right um, it's presumable that here we're talking about in fact some important distances in some kind of larger mm, kind of formations in general that, that is to say you don't have to imagine literally in fact the those those um, Achaemenid infantrymen addressing pajamas running after the chariots right uh, that would have been inconsistent as much as maybe the failure of the cha of the chariot had had occurred in itself they had to advance in closely uh, packed order in order to be effective and uh, yes it is true uh, in tactics it happens all the time for exploiting certain advantageous situations to, to actually break the ranks and taking some ground some position this is very easy even when still when, when that order was maintained you can find it I don't know during the seven years war when we think that soldiers were perfectly drilled never abandoned the line it's actually false it always happens but uh, here you need some distance the the chariots have to take some some elan uh, for the charge there must be some space um, also they properly can't be that distance uh, from that that close to infantry because it's it's always risky in a way or another to have a, a, a you know lines at such close uh, distance it, it is true that chariots are not properly aligned as we intended they're more like um, basically open order thing uh, de for how they are deployed in front of the thick uh, of the in fact of, of the solid line but again we're talking about at least hundreds of meters away from the enemy so uh, that cannot be covered in 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 ru by running because by the time you arrive at the enemy you're already exhausted and you can't even put up an effective fight so here as always it, it is probably to be meant in kind of a um, broader mm, picture on a larger scale organizationally speaking of course it could happen for some strange reason even a risky one that you know, a commanded chariots with guys we've seen it. The Sculion we have just two chariots, right? And then there is cavalry running behind. Here this this episode is interesting because Xenophon himself talks about infantry, but it made a lot of sense to think that cavalry, as in the previous example, would would, cl would be yeah, at that point definitely faster and better to exploit the, the gaps, right? Which are also being uh, probably a, a mess if you think about right you know pieces of people of horses you know this the, the, the chair smashed and things like these um, so not really such an easy ground to even lead a, a cavalry charge in the gap that's being created but that's about also the distress as we were saying before of, a, of an infantry unit it, even even um, the you know even absorbing successfully such a chair charge might have been uh, and, and maybe recomposing precariously the, the, the formation uh, might have been an effect of, you know, say, might have brought to defeat in a sense. Because you're scared, right? Your mind is blown, right? It doesn't happen every day to, to, to have four horses and, you know, this, this hundreds of kilos, you know, wagon thing running against you and, you know, in, especially on mass. It's, it's like you're, you're traumatized by it. Um, and and so at that point a cavalry charge can definitely help you know making you break and running away if you're still standing there in one piece um, and um, so I believe this is mostly the deal with with such with such example and um, the so the, we have seen it with the Sculion with Farnabazus supporting his chariots with cavalry even though that was as kind of a small engagement so when things were again on a, on a larger scale things had to be more uh, kind of first of all simpler and but also more uh, more mediated like kind of like more 
more this with the, the, there could be less cooperation uh, it was more just like sending in these forces in a reserve sense and uh, you know hoping to will smash through right and that's it and, and that's important because in in practice uh, that's how they fold right they and it, the, the concept is obvious you have this kind of spearhead like it's a bit like the elephants were not used that differently in, in the array uh, you need a lot of space for them for the chariots it's the same you you want you don't you want them to be turned close towards the enemy you don't want them to run amok and to fall back on you uh, to smash your own lines in the process it did happen though and and especially consider that that chariots are dangerous for cavalry right for heavy cavalry the one that can't quite skirmish this guy has to close in and especially if it has sides that's admit, you know so ask the 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 Seleucids at, at Banesia, what happened in, in, in that situation. Um, so, yes, this is pretty much it. Naturally, at some point we will have to talk about the how these chariots were properly built, um, but that will be another video. Uh, it happens sometimes randomly that I make um, even that I choose my topics randomly, uh, properly, I that, that there are some similar teams that I touch. In the last month, I, I made a video about uh, the Egyptian chariots of the you know from the eighth to the the, the the sixth century BC. Another one of Celtic chariots, Britonic chariots. So now it happened like that, um, and I, uh, this was mostly about how were the these chariots employed as far as we know right and as you understand we know very few because this is the reality for for ancient warfare right there is not you know the deeply experienced grizzled um, history veteran that knows really how it went and you know you just have to find that guy no this just these are universally unknown and unknowable uh, topics right because we don't have the evidence and you can go comparative and um, how much you like, but uh, simply that's all we have. Um, and so uh, often things are simpler than they sound. So that's why I also like to criticize sources because they 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 say things their own way, and you have to try to interpret what they they wanted to say and how, right? Um, you 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 can't see in, in in Xenophon that kind of Western rationalistic scientificity that wants to explain in a mechanical sense what what is fundamentally a moral, di unmeasurable moral dimension, right? With, a, with Hellenic historiography, you have always to bear that in mind. With other historiography, it's not so much. And often, uh, as insightful, of course, as Hellenic history and historiography is, uh, sometimes the interpretation lies in something more, literally more consistent, like the Romans talking so much about moral forces are actually more more realistic, if you want, even in their rougher, more primitive mindset that kind of didn't really like literature more than that. Properly, the difference is made by moral forces. Yes, you got it right. Um, and uh, the word, that's what the Romans were somewhat m way more close of its in nature than, than basically any other culture that I'm aware of. And that's why Greece was taken over by the Romans. Because you may be a genius intellectually, but not quite realizing in practice what it takes to be done. And this von Clausewitz explains in a crystalline clear way. And this is what's, what's still, as Westerners, as Hellenic children, because that's what we are, right? The, the rationale part is, is it, 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 it's Hellenic in our world, uh, in our logical, critical thinking. We are all Greeks, let's say. Um, but um, there are pros, of course, because without uh, Hellenic, the Hellenic world, we, we wouldn't be the West. But there are also some cons we don't have to forget. Right, and we can find in other cultures that made up still the Western identity, actually some examples that that explain to you that we are also children of those other people, and that show that this kind of thing. And so, well, getting philosophical towards the end, but I, for today uh, we stop it here. I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you are interested in my upcoming content. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.